All right, we're ready to talk about correlation a little bit more. This should be a fairly brief lecture. First of all, there's Carl Pearson again, because check out that awesome clothing he's got. I want his suit. I also, you know, I want to be all awesome so I could wear it. So how big is a big correlation? Now this is kind of hard to determine. We have um, benchmarks and, and stuff like that, but it's hard to determine because R is not linear. As R goes from 0.1 to 0.2 to 0.3, you don't have a proportionate, well, you don't have a directly and and uniform proportionate increase in the actual strength of the relationship it represents. So if we were to plot the strength of R's association like this, and we have negative associations on the left in purple, positive on the right in red, zero in the middle, this is these are all the possible values of R. R can go from negative one to positive one. Negative one is a perfect negative association, R positive one is perfect positive association. And then we make bars, and the height of the bar indicates the strength of the association from negative to positive, this is what R looks like. Look at that curved line. The tops of those bars curve. They're not straight. It's not a V. It's a U. So uh, there's not a linear relationship between the apparent size of R and its actual size. Now, in the social sciences, sometimes people use this kind of convention, like a 0.1-ish uh, association is weak. And when you get up to like 0 0.3, 0 0.35, sometimes 0.4, we say that's moderate. And then we'll take something that's 0.6 and say that's strong. Now, I suppose these words are very subjective, but in the biological and physical sciences where they study things that are not so much the result of dozens or hundreds of variables aggregating their influence, and so much of what we study in the social sciences is like that, then you can get much stronger correlations. I think people in physics might be a little disdainful of a correlation that was below maybe 0.6, whereas if you're doing personality research, that's about as good as you can hope for. Hopefully you didn't hear that whole um, digression as the janitor came in. Anyway, it's weird though, because look at how, look at how far 0.6 is below this. It's only a third of the way up. 0.6 seems like, oh, I'm more than halfway to 0.1, but you're not. The actual strength, you're only about a third of the way there. So other disciplines define things differently. These strong, moderate, and weak sort of mean strong, moderate, and weak based on what you can expect in some of the social sciences. Now there are some branches of psychology that regularly get ridiculously strong correlations. Cognitive psychology is one of them. Social psychology occasionally gets very strong correlations. Biological psychology, because they sometimes deal with variables that are very direct in their action. You're, you're dealing with something that is not acted on by tons and tons of other variables. You're not looking at like an averaging of a dozen different vectors every time you measure something. But frequently we are. So let's talk about R squared, sometimes called the coefficient of determination, usually called R squared. <coughs> this is a good measure of effect size. In other words, how much of a relationship is there? Now the question of how much of a relationship is a totally separate issue of whether it's statistically significant or whether it really describes the relationship you're looking at. Um, so R and R squared tell us how good our model is. A correlation coefficient is a model of the relationship between things. It's a model that just says this is the correlation, it's this strong, and it's positive or it's negative. It's not a very complicated model, but it's a model. So this, uh, the correlation coefficient tells us how good our model is. It's both our model and the goodness of our model. And it tells us how well our model fits the data. And we're always interested in that. This model, how well does it really describe our data. But it's hard to interpret because of that nonlinear thing. R squared, it's the same thing, just squared. So we haven't really changed anything. It's just a transformation of it. It's like R with a hat on. It's like you put on glasses, now R is R squared. It didn't change who it is. But it's much easier to interpret, and it's very easy to calculate. You just square the R value. And it's an easy to understand measure of how much association there is. So frequently we use R squared to remind ourselves of how much things are happening. Now, with numbers that are less than 1, when you square them, they get even smaller. They get closer to 0. So R squared values are embarrassing. You say, I have a 0 0.6 correlation. Wow, that's so strong. And then somebody says, what's the R squared? And you say, oh, 0 0.6 times 0 0.6 is 0 0.36. 0 0.36. 0 0.36, 0 0.4 doesn't sound as exciting as 0 0.6. So let's talk about how we interpret R squared and how we understand correlation coefficients in general. There's always variability in one of our variables. Now, y is the one we're always interested in. We love y. So uh, we describe this variability with standard deviations or variance. Those are variability measures. So variance, 
the variance of y is variation in y, variability in y, differences in individual differences between the uh, different observations in y. We've been dealing with that up until now. We called it x, but it's whatever. It doesn't really matter. It's a variable. And y is the variable we're really concerned with when we have two variables. We love y. Why? Why isn't every observation the same? Now, if every observation is the same, like you can say uniform wearingness of state troopers on the job, that is not an interesting variable because the answer is yes for everybody. It's one. Or you can say um, amount of being alive of all the people in this room. Well, the amount is alive. There's no variability in that. Well, you could say some people are a little more dead, but technically, no, they're alive. So there are... Um, there's no, not much variability in certain variables, and we're not interested in that. We need variability or variance to explain. Variance is where science happens. If there's no variance, there's nothing to explain. Nothing is happening. So why isn't every observation the same? Why is there variability? That's what we're concerned with. We're always concerned with explaining variability. Well, a partial answer can be because of x, because of this other variable. I mean, if there's a correlation between y and x, then x is explaining some of this variability in y. Let's see how that works a little bit. R squared, the interpretation is that R squared is the proportion of variance in y that is explained by x, or more technically, by the x-y relationship, by the correlation, the relationship between x and y. Sometimes correlation as a word means the relationship in an abstract sense, but sometimes correlation means only the correlation coefficient, the number. So I'll try and be precise, but I slip as most people in this field do. So let's start this over again. Let's say this is um, y right here. This is y, just dots on a number line. So here are dots on a number line. Um, we can plot the mean of y. The mean of y is now our, our model of y. A mean is a model. This is an odd thing to think of, but if you think there's a model citizen in your group, that's the citizen everybody wants to be like. Or if you say, Joe Plummer is a model of America, that means he is the average. He represents the average American. So a mean can be a prototype. It's a model. It's a model of the entire data set. Not a great model, because it's not really close to everything. It's a good model for these points here, but it's not a very good model for this stuff up here, but nothing's perfect. But that's our best model. And from that model, we can say how typical, or how good is that model? How far, on average, are our observations from the prototypical observation that we've come up with? We use this formula to calculate the mean. How far is everything? So these blue dashed lines represent the distance. These are deviations. What we're doing is we're calculating variance, because variance is y minus y bar, x minus x bar. Each observation minus its mean, right? Uh, add that up, and you have variance. So we're calculating variance, but I'm talking about it differently. I'm saying variance is a measure of how well or how badly the model fits the data. Y bar says, I'm prototypical. If you want to talk about this group of data at all, you might as well talk about me. I'm the mean. You can just talk about me. I am the data. And then we say, oh, really? How much are you really the data? Well, this much. There's this deviation. So these deviations from Y, we add them all up, and that's variance. So that's what we do when we're calculating variance. We just take the distance of every individual score from the mean of all the scores, and that's the variation in the variable. It's also a measure of how good a model the mean is of the entire data set. If there's a lot of deviation, then the mean isn't a very good model. If there's a little deviation, then the mean's a great model. It's kind of hard to know how good that is, but um, until you compare it to some, some sort of benchmark, but this is the variance of y. It's how, it's the badness of fit of our model. Y is a model of the whole data set, and this is how bad a model it is. These are the deviations from Y, the difference between the model and the reality. So what if we take Y and we add another variable? Now the mean is still there, but it, now it's a line. Because now, let's say these are ACT, or SAT scores, and we're trying to explain SAT scores. Previously, we're saying we explain them by the mean. Well, our best model of SAT scores is the mean is 500. Well, now we can do something different. We can say we have something else. Let's say these are like um, college prep scores or on some college prep test or something like that. So we can say now our explanation for why people have different SAT scores is 
because they have different college preparation levels here on this scale from 0 to 20. We can fit a best fit line through that, and that's very useful to us. That best fit line represents the relationship. It's the model now. The model was previously the mean. This was the model. That horizontal line was the model. That's not a very good model. This is a better model. Why? Because the line is closer to more of the dots. There's less deviation for this line than there was from the other line. Let's look at that. Let's measure that a bit. Each of these vertical lines is a deviation. It's how far the SAT score is from the SAT score that would be predicted from what we know about the relationship between SAT scores and this college prep test. So this is the deviation from our best model of the relationship. And that best model is better than the mean model. So the variance from predicted Y, so every, every imaginary dot on that yellow line is a predicted Y value. So there's a predicted Y value for every actual observation, and then there's an actual Y value. So we're looking and seeing how different is the predicted from the actual. Same as what we did before. Before we had difference from the predicted Y, but our best predicted Y was the mean of Y. And the differences were, were large. Now the differences on average are smaller. And that's the variance from predicted y. That's the deviation from our best model, or deviation from the regression line. Now these blue lines, I just copied and pasted and took the arrowheads off of them. That's the added up variance of y. This is the deviation of the variance from the mean of y. So that variance was big, bigger. And we've reduced that variance by tilting that line, or putting a different model in there, a tilted line, that, goes, that gets closer to the dots. So overall, if you add all these things up, you'd have less of a long line than here. This would be longer. There's more deviation. There's less deviation here. Because deviation from this line is less. This line fits better. So this is a mathematical way of saying we found a line that fits better. By tilting the line, we got it to fit these dots better. And so that's the interpretation of R squared. The difference between this and this, the amount that we're able to reduce the badness of prediction by just using the mean, to the badness of prediction that we have now using this two-dimensional mean, the, um, the, ability to the amount that we reduced our uncertainty or increased our ability to predict, we say that's the amount of variance that is accounted for. This is variance, and we accounted for some of it by including this other variable, by spreading things out and having two variables. This is the variance that we had with only one variable in a model. This is the variance we have with two, two, two variables in the model. The difference between those two things is R squared. So R squared is linear. This is how R squared works. It's always positive because it's squared. And the interpretation, R squared is the proportion or percentage of variance in Y, we might say variability in Y, that is accounted for, or we could say due to, or explained by, the relationship between X and Y. That's the interpretation. The proportion of variance in Y that is accounted for by the relationship between X and Y. So if R squared is 0.5, then half of the variation in Y, 50% of the variability in Y, is accounted for by its relationship with X. So this is a really important thing to know. And we're done with that lecture, and we'll move on to more regression-y lectures when we have a chance.